Welcome to session 60 of the Worlds of Speculative Fiction series. In this one, we are going to be looking at Olaf Stapleton, a new author to us, and two of his novels in particular, The Last and First Men and Star Maker, which are available in this single volume. He wrote quite a bit more, but those are the two that we're going to focus on. So before we get started, for anybody who's new and anybody who wants to celebrate with us, I mean, it's pretty amazing that we've gotten to 60 sessions of the worlds of speculative fiction. And, you know, just a review for those of you who've been with us this whole time and for anybody else who's joining us anew, what is the worlds of speculative fiction series? Well, it started out as a set of face-to-face -face lectures and discussions that were hosted by the Brookfield Public Library shortly after we moved back here to uh, the city of Milwaukee. Brookfield is a suburb of Milwaukee. And we pitched this uh, series that would be about fantasy and science fiction and horror and other modes of speculative fiction. And there were two really key components to it, other than, you know, giving a talk and having some discussion. So one of them is that it involves looking at world building across a number of different works. So, you know, great example of this, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and The Cimmerillion, one of the first ones that we began with, or C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy, or, you know, George R. Martin's uh, Song of Ice and Fire. You got multiple works, and we look at the world building and what's going into that. And then we also focused quite heavily on philosophical themes that would come up within these works. And now why am I doing all of this rehashing? Well, Olaf Stapleton was a, a philosopher. He actually taught philosophy, wrote a number of philosophical works, including books, but also a number of articles. And that stuff flowed into his novels, which he thought were maybe a better way of getting traction, getting his ideas out there and being considered than just writing philosophy books. And he was living at a time when he thought that doing philosophy in a public way, philosophy that could reach a broad public was particularly important. A lot of this writing is taking place in between the two world wars. So, you know, this is really, I think, a uh, central thing uh, for the worlds of speculative fiction series. Now back to the, the story. So we, we continued for the first year and we did a lot of, you know, cool, uh, worlds and authors and texts. And then we got renewed for a second season, you could say, and it just kept going on and on and on until we hit COVID and the lockdowns in, uh, 2020. And then, you know, we didn't do any of it for a while. And, and then I started thinking, people started asking, hey, are you going to do something with this series? Is it just dead in the water? And I thought, well, I could just shoot it here and do things a little bit differently. Do about maybe an hour and a half of lecture, you know, to the audience about the sort of things that we would typically cover. And then we would have a Zoom session for video conferencing for maybe another hour and a half afterwards. And some of the people who used to come to the Brookfield sessions began participating as well as people uh, in all sorts of other places, including, you know, in Africa and Europe and South America and North America, uh, mostly a matter of time zone, I think. Uh, and so it's, it, the series has continued on and we did a lot of other new authors, went back to some old authors and people have been asking me for a very, very long time, why don't you do Olaf Stapledon? And I, you know, at first I was like, you know, I, I think I've heard that name, but I've never read anything by the guy. I better check out who he is. And so I, I looked online and he seemed kind of interesting and, you 
you know, I had him lined up for uh, a couple times and then it just kind of fell through. And then finally this year, 2022, I was like, no, we got to do Stapleton. We got to finally get around to this. And so I got my hands on, on this and I got uh, a copy of his The Modern Theory of Ethics, one of his uh, non fiction, you know, straight philosophy books. And I read a few of his articles as well and a number of different things that were said about the guy. And so, you know, we're going to talk about the, the stuff that we usually do in these series. We'll talk about his biography. We'll talk a bit about the reception of his works. We'll talk about the world building, which is rather unique in these two novels, in part because you could say in some respect, they're more world building than novel. <laughs> so we'll talk also about is his work really science fiction or does it have to have a different classification? And then we'll talk about a number of different philosophical themes that are coming up in his works. Um, I'm actually going to make use of a, let's call it rhetorical strategy that Stapleton himself uses over and over again in these two novels. And I'm guessing in some of his other works as well, because I haven't read the other uh, novels. He, he will often say, you know, I could linger and uh, digress about the, the life of these people here or the conversations that they had or what was going on. But we're going to like skip over it, just do things at a very, very high level of uh, generality. Right. We're going to do a grand sweep. And so that's part of what I am going to take the license to do in this exposition here of Stapleton. And I will say something right off the bat. So I found these two novels to be rather of a, what we call a slog, right? It's not super fascinating reading where you're going from page to page. And you're like, oh my God, what's happening next? Well, I can't believe what these characters are doing this. I got to find out what's, what's going on, right? It's not a page turner in that way. As a matter of fact, you know, it's fairly small print for, you know, around, uh, well, we got 434 pages between the two novels. And because there aren't really a lot of characters, there's only a few actually, in the first novel, The Last and First Men. And there's there are a few characters in Star Maker, um, but not an awful lot. It's mostly about like the development of rational beings. I mean, we could say it, we could call it human development if we want for reasons that we'll talk about a little bit later, but let's just call it the development and decline, the, the rise, decline, you know, the development, the conflicts, the successes and failures of rational beings throughout the, the universe uh, in, in the second one and, and specifically of the human races in the first one. Um, it's, it's not the kind of work I think that a lot of people who are used to the sci-fi genre would necessarily find very attractive, very compelling, you know, dragging them along through the story. But if you're interested in philosophical ideas and you're interested in like the broad conception of what, you know, philosophical topics, what is the universe really about and what makes us human and are we, you know, on the rise? Are we declining? You know, how do we deal with the problems that we face as not just societies, but as an entire human race? Well, then I think you'll probably find these works pretty interesting. And, you know, they were well regarded in, in their time and influential on a number of other sci-fi authors. So, you know, they're well worth going into. It is a bit of an acquired taste. Probably the more <clears throat> philosophically oriented you are, um, the more interesting you will find them. But let's, uh, that's probably enough to say about uh, Stapleton's novels at the beginning. Let's talk next uh, about his biography, we'll do a little bit of a digression because I think that tells you why he wrote these novels and it gives you, you know, some sense of who the guy was. And then we'll talk about the world building itself and the vast sweep of cosmic time 
that is involved. And then we'll go into a number of important philosophical themes. But like I said, you know, we're going to make use of his own rhetorical dodge of just hitting on a few high notes. We're not going to try to do something absolutely comprehensive because that would take many more hours than we have for this particular discussion. With an author like Olaf Stapleton, we have to look at his biography to some degree in order to situate these, these two novels in particular that we're looking at, but also his other works, which comprise a, you could say, connected body, whether they're his science fiction works or his nonfiction works or indeed his uh, early poetry and the other things that he's doing as well, because he is a philosopher as well as a novelist and short story writer. So his story begins in 1886. He's born to William Clibbett Stapledon and Emmeline Mill, and the family is living a good bit of time in his first six years in Port Said, Egypt. And you might say, well, why is that the case? He's actually born in England, but his, his family, his grandfather established a shipping company that's going back and forth between Liverpool and Port Said. And that's gonna play a, a role later on in his life. Um, in 1903, he meets this Australian cousin, Agnes Zena Miller, who's later on going to assume an uh, important role in his life. Um, and by eight, 1908, he is publishing essays. So he is, um, you know, in his, his uh, early 20s. Um, he <clears throat> goes to school and then he goes off to Oxford. And it's while he's at, um, uh, and I'm probably mispronouncing this, uh, Balliol uh, College, Oxford, um, where he's going to earn his, his Bachelor in Modern History in 1909. That's where he begins doing his first writings. Um, then he begins working in the shipping offices for this company, both in Liverpool and in Port Said in the family business. He doesn't appear to have been particularly interested in that or particularly diligent. And in 1912, he begins a new job working for the Liverpool branch of the Workers' Educational Association. So he's already engaging in some educational work as somebody who just has a college degree. Um, a year later in 1913, he earns his uh, master's also from Oxford. And then of course, you notice what's gonna happen immediately, the First World War. And by this time, you know, Stapleton has uh, sort of organized his thoughts about things. He's a pacifist, he's a conscientious objector, but he's not a coward. So by 1915, he is actually out there in Belgium and he joins the Quaker funded Friends Ambulance Unit and becomes an ambulance driver. Now that's a pretty dangerous job. He will eventually earn the uh, Croix de Guerre for bravery. Uh, you know, which is, is, I think, pretty easy to display <clears throat> if you have it, if you're an ambulance driver, because you got to go and get the wounded in one of the bloodiest wars in history. The war ends. I should point out, too, that in 1914, um, he does author something called Latter-day Psalms, and these are poetry. He is not a Christian, but he's going to write some sort of, you know, poetry that, that are connected to religion. And we'll talk about that a bit more. So in, in 1919, he finally uh, leaves the service. Obviously the war ends in with the armistice in 1918, but that doesn't mean that everybody goes home right away. So he does come home and then he marries this cousin of his, Agnes Zena Miller, and they live in Britain. Um, they have a daughter, Mary, who is born in 1920, and in 1923, his son, John, is born. And, you know, he continues working, and um, then he earns, in 1925, a PhD in philosophy 
from the University of Liverpool. So you notice that he's going from Oxford to Liverpool, and you know this this allows him to to work on his his uh, degree while he's also a working person and you know uh, engaging with the family life, and he begins lecturing. Now this is where the story I think gets really really interesting. So Stapledon is a professor of philosophy, but he's not an ordinary professor of philosophy. He's not one of these stuffy sorts who is in the, you know, the ivory tower, as we say. He actually teaches in what is called the extramural department. Now, what does the extramural mean? Outside of the walls, outside of the university and he teaches philosophy english literature industrial history and psychology so he's teaching not just regular college students but what we would nowadays call continuing education or working people and stuff like that so he is already doing something that's rather unusual and he's also engaging in what nowadays we call public philosophy he's giving lectures to all sorts of clubs and organizations on a variety of important topics. In 1928, uh, his revised dissertation, A Modern Theory of Ethics, A Study of the Relations of Ethics and Psychology, quite an interesting work. I've, I've read it. I've enjoyed it, uh, is published. And in 1930, he publishes The Last and First Men. So he publishes a, a book of ethics, a book of philosophy, and then he publishes this novel of incredible scope. And you can say, what's going on there? Well, Stapledon thought that he had a better chance of reaching a much wider audience by writing fiction. Or as he's going to say a little bit later, when we look at what he says in the forward of that, creating myths. And this allows him to you know, decide to become a full-time writer as well as to teach. So 1930, Last and First Men, we see a follow-up to this in 1932 with The Last Men in London, which is not quite as great a novel. In 1934, he publishes another nonfiction work, Waking World. And in 1935, he publishes another novel that we're not going to talk about here because I haven't read it, but it's worth pointing out. It is called um, Odd John, A Story Between Jest and Ernest. And the theme of that one is a bit different than Star Maker and um, Last and First Men. It has to do with a Superman in, in our world and how he would fit in with society. So it's taking on some of the, you know, ideas of the time. Um, then in 1937, we have Star Maker published, right? And in um, 1939, he publishes quite a few works, Saints and Revolutionaries, New Hope for Britain, Philosophy and Living. And as we know, the, you know, the second great war between, uh, at the very start, Germany uh, versus Poland, uh, and then France and, and Britain come in on the side of Poland. Poland is, is cut apart by Germany and the Soviet Union, and it begins the Second World War. And even though he's a pacifist, even though he was, was a conscientious objector in the previous war, Stapledon says, we need to fight the Nazis. We need to fight against fascism. There, there's certain lines that have been crossed, and so he supports the war effort against Nazi Germany. He also, he had always been sort of on the, on the side of the left, and he becomes an advocate uh, in 1942 of the newly formed, as it's often described, Libertarian Socialist Commonwealth Movement and Party. And he publishes at that time Darkness and the Light, uh, another uh, fiction work, and Beyond the Isms, uh, which is kind of an interesting piece as well. Um, in, you know, the war goes on in 1944. He publishes Seven Pillars of Peace. You notice that he's al already very interested in thinking about what would be the conditions of world peace. And he publishes The Old Man uh, in New World. And uh, then the war comes to an end. 
1946, he publishes Youth and Tomorrow and the fiction work Death into Life. 1947, another fiction work, The Flames of Fantasy. And then in 1948, he's uh, traveling around speaking at uh, a lot of important places, including the World Congress of Intellectuals for Peace in Poland. He also publishes Interplanetary Man. Uh, 1949, he speaks at the Conference for World Peace held in New York City. And in 1950, he actually becomes involved with the South African anti-apartheid movement. He speaks in Paris, France. He's supposed to speak in, in Yugoslavia, but has to cancel that. Returns home sick and dies of a heart attack, but publishes A Man Divided uh, at that time. And there's a few of his works that are published posthumously, The Opening of the Eyes, Four Encounters, East is West. And, you know, it's, it's not that long of a life, but he's, he's, you know, spending a lot of time engaging in, you know, working as a public intellectual and doing so in ways that feed into some of the themes of these these two great novels. I do want to read you because you know we want to talk about the the motive for writing these. Well, he tells us them in his preface uh, to to each of them, and so. He says in the preface to uh, The Last and First Men, This is a work of fiction. I have tried to invent a story which may seem a possible, or at least not wholly impossible, account of the future of man. I've tried to make that story relevant to the change that's taking place today in man's outlook. And he goes on and says um, that to romance of the future may seem to be indulgence and ungoverned speculation for the sake of the marvelous, but controlled imagination in this sphere can be a very valuable exercise for minds bewildered about the present and its potentialities. Today, we should welcome and even study every serious attempt to envisage the future of our race, not merely in order to grasp the very diverse and often tragic possibilities that confront us, but also that we may familiarize ourselves with the certainty that many of our own most cherished ideals would seem puerile to more developed minds. To, to romance of the far future, then, is to attempt to see the human race in its cosmic setting and to mold our hearts to entertain new values. He goes on a little bit further and he says, Our aim is not merely to create aesthetically admirable fiction. We must achieve neither mere history nor mere fiction, but myth. A true myth is one which, within the universe of a certain culture, expresses richly and perhaps tragically the highest admirations possible within that culture. A false myth is one which either violently transgresses the limits of credibility set by its own cultural matrix or expresses admiration less developed than those of its culture's best vision. This book can no more claim to be true myth than true prophecy, but it is an essay in myth creation. That is what he's attempting to to do here. In um, Star Maker, which is written, you know, closer to the beginning of uh, World War II, he begins his preface by saying this, at a moment when Europe is in danger of a catastrophe worse than that of 1914, a book like this may be condemned as a distraction from the desperately urgent defense of civilization against modern barbarism. Year by year, month by month, The plight of our fragmentary and precarious civilization becomes more serious. Fascism abroad grows more bold and ruthless in its foreign ventures, more tyrannical towards its own citizens, more barbarian in its contempt for the life of the mind. Even in our own country, we have reason to fear a tendency towards militarization and the curtailment of civil liberty. Moreover, while the decades pass, no resolute step is taken to alleviate the injustice of our social order. Our outworn economic system dooms millions to frustration. And he says, in these conditions, it's difficult for writers to pursue their calling at once with courage 
and with balanced judgment. Some merely shrug their shoulders and withdraw from the central struggle of our age. These, with their minds closed against the world's most vital issues, inevitably produce works which not only have no depth of significance for their contemporaries, but are also subtly insecure. And <clears throat> he goes on and he says, I have a, a sympathy with some of those intellectuals who declare they have no useful contribution to make to the struggle and therefore had better not dabble in it. I, in fact, am one of them. In our defense, I should say that though we are inactive or ineffective as direct supporters of the cause, we do not ignore it. Indeed, it constantly obsessively holds our attention. And so, you know, he goes on and he, and he says that, um, here we go, uh, at the risk of raising thunder on both the left and the right, I have occasionally used certain ideas and words derived from religion, and I have tried to interpret them in relation to modern needs. The valuable, though much damaged words, spiritual and worship, which have become almost as obscene to the left as the good old sexual words are to the right, are here intended to suggest an experience which the right is apt to pervert and the left to misconceive. This experience, I should say, involves detachment from all private, all social, all racial ends, not in the sense that it leads a man to reject them, but it makes him prize them in a new way. This enterprise, he goes on, can lead us to an increased lucidity and finer temper of consciousness and therefore can have a great and beneficial effect on behavior. Indeed, if this supremely humanizing experience does not produce along with a kind of piety towards fate, the resolute will to serve our waking humanity, it is a mere sham and a snare. So there we have his partial descriptions of his own projects that we see him carrying out through fiction and also through nonfiction philosophy. I would like to point out one other thing before we close this biographical section. He also wrote many articles, as I've discovered, within philosophy. He didn't just write books. He contributed to academic philosophy in quite interesting ways that we can talk about elsewhere. So that's uh, some of Stapleton's background. We should talk now about his world building. I had mentioned earlier that world building is working in somewhat of a different manner in Ola Stapleton's novels, The Last and First Men and Star Maker. And if we think about what world building does typically in sci-fi, fantasy, horror, speculative fiction, in general, whether it's, you know, fairly minimal or whether it is, you know, super elaborate in, in the way of like a Tolkien or a um, R. Scott Backer or somebody like that. What's happening usually with world building is there's, a, you know, a lot of thought given to developing the narrative universe in which things are taking place. And a lot of that is, you know, really cool stuff, but it's there to provide a setting, to provide a milieu for the characters to do and say things, to have, you know, conflicts, to fight each other, to overcome obstacles. And, you know, there's usually some back history and there's some development going on as well. So plot takes place within the framework of the world that has been built or is in the process of being continually built. And, you know, the plot is part of the history and the characters are also part of the world. So there's a, a very complex, dynamic and dialectical interrelation between them. Now, Stapleton's works are a bit different. There aren't a lot of characters. There's, you know, there's a main character in Star Maker, the narrator, right, who you know, very quickly winds up being connected with other minds who then come along for the uh, ride free, free of space and time, <laughs> checking out all these different cultures, and almost all of them are unnamed. There's also a few characters in Last and First Men. There's a prophet at one point. There's this great, you know, uh, contest between the representative of, you know, uh, a, a much later Chinese and a much later American 
empires, right? Uh, but for the most part, there aren't a, there aren't a lot of characters. The, the characters, if there are anything that we want to call characters, they are entire races of human beings or, you know, r other rational beings that are going to be called rational beings. So, you know, going back to thinking about world building in other authors works we often have a lot of geography sometimes with maps we have you know development of and depiction of cultures uh we have languages sometimes being worked out certainly names that have some sort of commonality to them and have connotations sometimes they'll actually go into the economics of it uh, some more than others, and there's you know usually some some history going on that's happened that's important for the present. Um, there's technology or magic or whatever else is being added to things, and sometimes the world building is like an elaboration of the world that we inhabit, and sometimes it's like its own world. You know, think about Andre Norton's Witch World, right? Starts out very early on with a guy here in earth and then it quickly gets transposed into the witch world and, and all of that sort of stuff happens there or um, Philip Jose Farmer's world of tears in which it's revealed that earth is just one pocket universe of many that were developed by these, you know, creatures that are like us human beings, but are very powerful and ancient called the Lords, right? Or, you know, if you think about um, uh, H.P. Lovecraft's uh, Cthulhu stuff, we have, we have the earth of our place, and it's sort of like Tales from the Dark Side, you know, there's, there's the surface level that most people live in, and then there's the dark side, which is, you know, just as real, but not as brightly lit, in which elder beings can, you know, invade our universe and stuff like that. So, you know, that's the typical kind of world building. Stapleton is like turning things on, on their head without meaning to. The world building is the plot in a certain way, you could say, right? And it's, you know, sometimes more explicit and sometimes less so. What we see being depicted here in these stories is the transformation, the changes, the conflicts, the seeking after greater things, the descent into madness and pathological individualism or, you know, some kind of fascism or pick whatever else you, you want. Um, you know, there's a transformation that's taking place, you could say physiologically of the beings themselves. There's transformation geographically and planet wise and in, in, you know, uh, star maker, even to some degree in last and first men, there is, you know, um, transformation of entire solar systems or of much larger, uh, systems in play. So, you know, you've got the transformation of the bodies of, of beings. You've got the transformation of the ecology and the, uh, interplanetary and then, you know, interstellar systems. And you have transformation of society and culture and mindsets and stuff like that. And the rising and falling and facing challenges. And all of those are parts of world. And that is what these two novels chart out. Uh, so it, it's world building as a dynamic process, you might say. Uh, and it, it gets into an incredibly cosmic scale in star maker where by the end they're you know it's like the whole universe is being interconnected and they're seeking out the the generator the creator the originator of all of this the star maker and it's a, an intergalactic civilization that's doing that that seeking and so you know there's, there's some pretty cosmic scope going on in here. And this leads us to um, one of the first philosophical themes, I think. How can Stapleton tell us that kind of story? So I want to say one thing right off the bat, which is that um, Stapleton, for you know whatever criticisms you may make of him, has an incredibly fertile imagination. And it's not just imagination. 
but sort of like a com combination of imagination, creative imagination, and intellect put together at the same time, working out, uh, you know, society after society, human race after human race, in, in all these myriad ways. Now, he does oftentimes beg off and say, well, I can't tell you too much more about this because that would, like, as, as he says at one point, generate an entire library <laughs> rather than a book. But what he does give us is incredibly varied and fertile. And, it, you know, this, these will make you think quite a lot about the possibilities for our own human civilization and us as groups and individuals. So that's one side. But there's an even more important issue that arises, and it's a narrative issue, and it's also a philosophical, specifically epistemological issue. How can the narrator actually know the things that they're narrating? How can the author, you know, in a narrative sense, pretend to be a being who can tell these stories that are covering incredibly long periods of time, you know, are they a historian of time past? Well, how do they know about this stuff then? And here's where we get to a really interesting plot device. We can call it the overcoming of space and time. And in the first novel, The Last and First Men, this is happening towards the the end of the human races, which now humanity is on Neptune because, you know, the world, the earth has been a long since rendered uninhabitable as has been Venus, as has Mars. And now they're out on Neptune and, and the human race has changed quite a lot. And so um, here's a, a little passage. We've watched the fortunes of eight successive human species for a thousand million years. The first half of that flicker, which is the duration of man, ten more species now succeed one another or are contemporary on the plains of Neptune. We, the last men, are the eighteenth men of the eight pre-Neptunian species. Some, as we have seen, remained always primitive. Many achieved at least a confused and fleeting civilization. One, the brilliant fifth, was already awakening into true humanity when misfortune crushed it. The, tr the ten Newtonian species show an even greater diversity. They range from instinctive animal to modes of consciousness never uh, before uh, attained, the definitively subhuman degenerate types are confined mostly to the first 600 million years of man's sojourn on Neptune. During the earlier half of a, this long phase of preparation, man, at first almost crushed out of existence by a hostile environment, gradually peopled the huge north, but with beasts, not men. And he goes on, right? So these are some really, really long periods. Now, how, how does he know that? How can the, the 18th men have any idea of this? Well, they have overcome the um, confines of time, right? And he talks about the uh, the racial mind transcending the minds of groups and individuals and philosophical insight into the true nature of space and time, mind and its objects, cosmical striving and cosmic cosmical per, uh, perfection. And, you know, he, he goes on and he tells us that, um, you know, there's this whole racial experience that they can access from their, their particular sets of men. And then, you know, he goes on and he tells us that um, they're able to go back into all of the previous races and, you know, sort of, so to speak, recall or remember what is going on. As individuals, he says, we can hold within one now a duration equal to the old terrestrial day. And within that duration, we can, if we will, discriminate rapid pulsations such as commonly we hear together as a high musical tone. As the race mind we perceived is now the whole period since the birth of the oldest living individuals and the whole past of the species appeared as a personal memory stretching back into the myths of infancy. But if we wanted to, we could discriminate within the now one light vibration from the next. So they can, they can go back in, in time and um, hear, see, sense what's going on. In um, Star Maker, 
we have a disembodied mind from England who winds up going out into the, the cosmos and, you know, hooks up with this, this philosopher on another planet. And then they begin spending time searching through the galaxy. And he says, along with freedom of space, we had freedom of time. Some of the worlds we explored in this early phase of our adventure ceased to exist long before my native planet was formed. Others were its contemporaries. Other were not, others were not born till the old age of our galaxy when the earth had been destroyed and a large number of the stars had already been extinguished. As we searched up and down space and time, discovering more and more of the rare grains called planets, as we watched race after race struggle to a certain degree of lucid consciousness only to succumb to some external accident or more often to some flaw in its own nature, it goes on, right? So they're able to watch like entire worlds and species, which he's willing to call human, another theme we'll pick up in a bit, develop, advance, decline. They're able to overcome uh, the problems of, you know, distance and temporal separation. And, you know, he, he goes on. Uh, this is much later on when he's talking about the community of worlds. The last and most difficult power to be obtained to be attained by those worlds in the course of their utopian phase was psychical freedom of space and time, the limited power to observe directly and even to contribute to events remote from the spatiotemporal location of the observer. Throughout our explorations, we'd been greatly perplexed by the fact that we, most of whom were beings of a very humble order, should have been able to achieve this freedom, which we now discovered the, these highly developed worlds found so difficult to master. The explanation was given to us. And here's another interesting theme. No such venture as ours could have been undertaken by our unaided selves throughout our exploration. We had unwittingly been under the influence of a system of worlds which had attained this freedom only after eons of research. Not one step could have been taken without the constant support of those brilliant ichthyoid and arachnoid symbiotics who played a leading part in the history of our galaxy. The freedom of space and time, the power of cosmical exploration and of influence by means of telepathic contact was at once the most potent and the most dangerous asset of the fully awakened utopian worlds. And so, you know, I'm not going to linger on, on the dangers and the opportunities, but what does this allow in terms of the world building and the narrative exposition? It's, you know, it's not scientifically explained, although Stapleton does know the science of his time quite well, um, but it's assumed to be something that a, a later civilization, much more advanced than our own, would in fact acquire and retrospectively not only can they observe what happened in the past they can influence it so they can give the narrator in star maker the chance to him and and the others that you know hang out with him and become disembodied minds uh going along the opportunity to overcome space and time and then to tell us the stories in an of course very adumbrated way within these novels, a rather ingenious way of, you know, on the one hand, um, overcoming that epistemological problem. How, how could they possibly know that stuff? And then, you know, how could they communicate it to us? And also a, you might say, narrative framing problem. And so, you know, this is all, uh, part of the backdrop, you could say, or the necessary condition for the world building that is so absolutely central to these stories. Before turning ourselves in a much more deliberate way and looking at the text and the philosophical themes that are not just arising or in the background, but, you know, front and center in these two novels, Last and First Men and Star Maker, I do want to touch a little bit more broadly on what Stapleton himself made of the genre that he's working in and what other people have made of his work and his commitments that we can see coming up in not just uh, his, his fiction work, but also his nonfiction work and indeed the way he lived his life. 
So I think if we if we look first at his views on politics and religion, that might be a good place to start. Um, you know, Stapleton was on the left, but not a Marxist. He actually thought that Marxist and Christianity uh, properly understood, had some things in common, and he was willing to take whatever good came out of either one of those. And in, in a piece called New Hope for Britain, a book, right, he actually um, looks at the four main British political parties trying to figure out what he can take, take from them. And this is coming from an article, Olaf Stapleton, Utopia and Worship by Vincent uh, Geoghegan. So Geoghegan says, and he's, he's excerpting here in part, that um, these elements, the, the precious elements, are not the exclusive property of particular parties. They can be found in a number of the traditions. From the conservative party, so the furthest right in this case, he digs out a belief in the English spirit, which he defines as a spirit of mutual respect between friendly organizers and those whom they organize between equals and between the humbler and more responsible workers for the common weal. In the case of the Liberal Party, Stapleton applauds its historic fundamental value, the intrinsic value of the individual human being, um, conceived at best as a defense of individual autonomy against both tyranny and conformism. The Labour Party has a grasp of the central importance of the social, that the social environment molds individual minds, and that as a consequence, the economic and the social need to be under the control of the people. And then finally, in the case of the Communist Party, there is the strong commitment to revolution and to the creation of a new society based on comradeship. So, you know, you notice that Stapledon is committed on one side, but he's willing to take whatever is good in the other, the other groups, the other sides. Um, in another piece, which is um, called The Great Certainty, uh, which I'm only going to read parts of here, he's looking at uh, religion. And Stapleton was an agnostic. He was not an atheist because he thought that that actually goes too far and is, is, uh, it represents a commitment that can't really be justified. He's also not a theist, uh, certainly not a, a Christian, but he's willing to say there's, there's probably something that we find in religion that could be humanized, that could be purified. And so here's what he says. There are three kinds of activity distinctive of personality which in the actual experience of them I perceive to be supremely good or right. Having this, I have not only to describe the three activities and the nature of personality, but also to show that the little words good and right have intelligible meaning. For the moment, I will leave over this abstract ethical problem and let good and right be interpreted as the reader chooses. The three kinds of activity may be roughly named intelligence, love, and creative action. It is tempting to call them the distinctively human or personal forms of cognition, affection, and con, uh, connation, which are the three aspects of consciousness. But intelligence, love, and creative action involve all three of these abstract aspects of consciousness, for each of them includes in some degree the other. They are indeed merely factors in the unitary conscious life of creatures that have obtained to some measure of personality. Sometimes one and sometimes another factor is more obvious. We may speak of an act of intelligence or of love or of creativeness, but in truth, intelligence is never loveless and it is always to a greater or lesser extent creative. Love is never wholly blind, undiscriminating, unintelligent, and is always mentally creative. And creation, in whatever sphere, involves some degree of intelligence and some kind of loving. He goes on and he says, the three names I have chosen must be interpreted very broadly. Intelligence must be taken to include all discriminative sensitivity. Uh, he goes on as well, 
and says the word love must be understood to include every kind of valuing of anything, not as a means, but disinterestedly for its own sake. The third intrinsically good activity is creative action. By this phrase, I mean every kind of consciously directed activity, which is and results in something significantly novel. And so this is what he thinks is there in religion when religion is doing its job right, when humankind is oriented religiously to things. But it's not just in religion. It can be in, in the life of you know, the, the mind. It can be in technology. It can be in social organization. It can be in political dispute. It can be in all sorts of manners. So I think this is, this is quite important, you know. Um, I do want to say a few other things as well that, that start to lead us outside of uh, politics and, and religion, per se, and, and into the craft work that Stapleton is involved in. Um, he had a correspondence with Virginia Woolf. And when Virginia Woolf read Star Maker, she uh, thought that the philosophical framework was, was a little bit difficult to understand, but she wrote and she said, I've understood enough to be greatly interested and excited to, since sometimes it seems to me you are grasping ideas I have tried to express much more fumblingly in fiction, but you have gone much further and I can't help envying you as one does those who reach what one has aimed at. And as somebody points out in the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction, entry on Alice Stapleton. Stapleton is, however, though sometimes dimly perceived, the star maker behind many subsequent stories of the far future and galactic empires. He did much original and seminal thinking about such matters as parallel worlds, colonization of other worlds, cosmology, cyborgs, ESP, hive minds, immortality, monsters, mutants, and time travel. And he was perhaps the first author to introduce the concept of the prime directive that we see in Star Trek. He was influential on Arthur C. Clarke, on Stanislaw Lem, on C.S. Lewis, who actually reacts against him and, and wrote the space trilogy to sort of thumb his nose at Stapleton. Um, there's also you know, something quite interesting that Jorge Luis Borges said. Uh, this is in a introduction to a 1965 Argentinian edition of Star Maker. Um, he said that Stapleton's style suggests that before writing, he'd read a great deal of philosophy and not many novels or poems. He also drew attention to the lack of hubris in a work as all encompassing a Star Maker. He says, Stapleton doesn't shore up inventions to distract or stupefy the reader. With an honest rigor, he pursues and retraces the complex and obscure vicissitudes of his coherent dream. From our contemporary vantage point, Star Maker is more than a prodigious novel. It is a possible and plausible representation of the plurality of worlds and of their dramatic history. So quite high praise from people in the business, so to speak, right, of speculative fiction. Stapleton himself didn't originally call what he was doing science fiction. He actually called... Uh, what he was doing, fantastic fiction of a semi-philosophical kind, or as we saw in the preface to first, uh, Last and First Men, myth-making. Stapleton, when he was um, uh, asked about science fiction, he said, I, I find myself in a bit of a hole about science fiction. I never was a fan of it, and I read very little of it. I recognize it as a legitimate medium of expression, and I think it has a future. He wrote this to a, a science fiction magazine. And then <clears throat> in a lecture called Science and Fiction, he sets out what he takes to be the rules of the game of science fiction, all of which are directed to the demands of fiction making. And there's three things that he, he requires at that point. Plausibility achieved by the fiction's conformity to the best current scientific knowledge. In that respect, he's in line with, say, Stanislaw Lem. Second, the imaginative creation of further possibilities developed by logical extension from current ideas. And three, psychological and spiritual relevance to human readers in the present through con the construction of, quote, myths of, for a scientific 
age. Now, um, you know, this actually gives us a, a, a good sense about what he's up to. And, you know, the third one connects him up with authors like, say, Ursula K. Le Guin or Philip Jose Farmer or uh, J.G. Ballard, right? Um, a little bit later, we find uh, that he's going to come up with other interesting rules as well. Um, but before we get to that, there's something that's coming out of Olaf Stapleton and the idea of science fiction by Robert uh, Crossley that I'd like to bring up. So Stapleton gave all these lectures about, you know, science fiction, what he's up to. Here's what, what uh, Crossley says. The roll call of scientifically venturesome poets and novelists in science and literature, this lecture that he gave, is the framework for Stapleton's construction of an iconoclastic tradition of writers who respond imaginatively, imaginatively both to words and numbers, to books and machines, and who try to unify the perspectives of the two cultures. The artists he names all seek, as he says of Dante, scientific verisimilitude according to the lights of their age. Even two writers, who Stapleton says display no direct influence of science, are treated as examples not of pure fantasy, but scientific method applied to fictional procedure. Rob Lay's Gargantua is not just a fantastic creature, but an instance of gigantism realistically worked out. The worlds of Gulliver reveal how Swift works out consequences of novel ideas, realism. And, you know, he, he brings up Bacon and... Butler, Meredith, Rosny, Abbott, and Verne. These form a line of prophet critics who offer visions, fancies, and warnings in fictional speculations that are rooted in scientific discoveries and laboratory method. He also talks about H.G. Wells, and Crosley says this, Next to Wells, Stapleton was the most original practitioner of the scientific romance in the first half of the century, professionally trained as a philosopher, much more patient with and drawn to abstraction than Wells. He ought to have been better equipped to formulate a theory of science fiction. Right? And Stapleton's first novel, Last and First Men, appeared in 1930. Reviewers noticed and overstated his work's resemblance to Wells. Just as Wells was irritated by being known as an English Verne, so Stapleton labored under the burden of having all his most innovative works tagged as Wellsian romances by critics unable to find a more accommodating pigeonhole for his disturbing visions of far futures and present oddities. The last thing I want to bring up is another list that and this is coming from a lecture, Man's Prospects. Uh, in 1934, Stapleton considers the uses of forecasting. That is, thinking about the future, how, you know, that, that's to come. And, and, you know, Stapleton, by the way, is, uh, you know, looked to by futurists and by transhumanists as somebody who, you know, is, you could say, in their circle. And so... Stapleton comes up with seven rules of the game of speculation. So what are these rules? First, up-to-date knowledge from a wide variety of disciplines, sociology, astronomy, biochemistry, and philosophy. Second, imaginative freedom from the limits of contemporary knowledge and the audacity to here beyond these limits. So you notice already we've got a dialectic between you, you, you know, you have to start with a good knowledge of the current sciences, but not just science, also philosophy. And then you got to go beyond. Third, a comprehensive and balanced vision that avoids the one dimensionality of a forecast that is merely economic, merely physical, merely psychological, and so on. An avoidance of reductionism. Fourth, a radical skepticism on the part of the prophet who should acknowledge the unlikelihood of all specific anticipations of the future, including his own. So however enthusiastic one becomes, you have to maintain this attitude of skepticism. Fifth, an ability to define the main questions of the future. Questions of work, class, leisure, human interests, political organization. Not just, you know, space opera and zap zap and fighting the empire or something like that or romance out in space. Real human issues, right? Not escapism. 
Six, a commitment to pursue the fundamental question. Well, what is this fundamental question? Will man be more developed mentally or fallen into barbarism? A really important point. Then finally, seventh, working distinctions among the near future measured in centuries, the middle future, thousands and hundreds of thousands of years, and the remote future, millions and billions of years. So a kind of difference of scope and distinction between what's possible in the near future, what could be happening in the middle future, and what could the destiny of humanity or rational races, as we're going to see, what could that look like millions of years from now? So these are some great ways to conceptualize what, what Stapleton is up to, particularly in these two works, but really throughout his entire career. In my view, one of the most interesting and indeed important philosophical themes running through these two novels, Last and First Men and Star Maker, is right there in the title of the first novel, Men. And Stapleton is not using this in a particularly gendered way. He means humanity and he means races of humanity. He's not thinking in terms of what we oftentimes will call race in our own experience, which is a, you know, incredibly socially constructed and historical bound up thing with all these arbitrary divisions that isn't the same from country to country and culture to culture. Instead, we're, we're thinking of, you know, entire species of human beings. But here's the really interesting thing. Stapledon is not particularly interested in distinguishing between humans on the basis of belonging genetically to the human race. Because as we find in, for example, Last and First Men, there are human races which are developed by other human races biologically, right? Using some of the stock. And then there are other human races that evolve out of animals. So it's not humanity in the genetic sense that we typically think of. Stapledon is willing to call men or human beings any species that is intelligent and that, you know, rises beyond a certain level and has, you know, say social organization and the capacity for intricate rational problem solving and passing things on through culture and perhaps even, you know, developing some kind of technology or language or something like that. And, you know, this could come from any sort of living basis. As a matter of fact, in Star Maker, he even talks about, you know, plants, for example, plant men as being part of this. At the very end, we get to the stars and their intelligent beings, as we're going to discover. So this is a very interesting anthropological commitment on his part, anthropological and a philosophical sense. And so what I thought we should do, you know, in part because in order to get a sense of what the first and last men is about, we should talk about these different, you know, first, second, third, these different races <coughs> or species of human beings. And he begins in our own time and he charts out an interesting history that didn't happen in our time, although we are, you know, in, again, I don't want to abuse this word interesting. We are moving towards a world that if it is bipolar in any respect would be America and China. And that's actually what ends up happening with the, <coughs> the first men, the first race. Uh, Europe basically exhausts itself in another war. There's all sorts of things that are going on that I don't have to go into great detail about. And eventually it leads to a world state, um, which is, you know, one of our, our possibilities. And, uh, you know, there's some upheavals and breakdowns. Um, there's, a, you know, environmental uh, catastrophes that take place. Humanity rises again in Patagonia and, you know, spreads uh, throughout the, the world and then, you know, other catastrophes and then there's Siberia. And then eventually the human race basically succumbs, develops, uh, rather 
degenerates into a kind of barbarism and you know it's it's millions of years before the second men arise and interestingly the second men are of a you know they're 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 human in the sense that they're rational and they have all these other human characteristics but they're unlike us in that they're not driven by some of the same egotistical egocentric desires that we ourselves are so prone to and they develop a nice little civilization until they get invaded by life forms from Mars who try to colonize the Earth. And eventually this is going to lead to a catastrophe. There's all sorts of things that go on, a war that takes place, um, some of the, the Martian genetic stuff getting, getting to be in human beings, sort of like how you know we have mitochondria and all that, and leading to problems and plagues. Then we have the third men arising. And these are smaller, their civilization is very focused on music and they live a sort of aesthetic, you know, aesthetic life, you could say. And they're eventually going to start leading to a new project, that of deliberately manipulating life into a new kind of human being. And they create these new human beings that have, well, they're not just, they have, they are just gigantic brains. And these gigantic brains live in silos and have connections with each other. Eventually they enslave uh, most of the third human race. And then eventually the fourth men, these giant brains realize their own limitations and begin constructing a new kind of race, the fifth men, who will eventually supplant both the third and the fourth and also colonize Venus, leading to uh, a genocide on Venus of the Venetian species. Um, the human beings supplant them. Eventually, this leads to the sixth men, who are a Venetian species. There's also a degeneration into this kind of seal-like animals as well. Perhaps one of the, the most fascinating groups is the Seventh Men, who have a civilization that is entirely not just avian, but aerial. And, um, you know, Stapledon, I've remarked before about his incredible powers of imagination. He, he imagines a society in which flight is the primary occupation and metaphor for things. Eventually this is going to lead to uh, realizing something has been lost and a, an eighth species evolves, the eighth men who are um, pedestrian compared to aerial and they redevelop technology. And then there is an, a, a, a catastrophe that's not just ecological or environmental, but solar system wide. The sun is going to start damaging the inner planets. So humanity has to adapt. And once again, there is a let's make human beings anew so that they can live out on Neptune. And these are some, you know, rather smallish uh, beings. They're they eventually fall into savagery and degenerate into to animals, a bunch of different animal types. And uh, then the 10th the through the 13th arise out of this rabbit-like species and become civilized. And, you know, one replaces the other in time. And then we have the 14th to the 17th, who are said to be sort of like replications of the first men, the second men, and the you know, basically idyllic, utopian fifth men who are so advanced. And then finally we get to the, the 18th, the last men, a final species, the most advanced, the ones who are telling the story in uh, last and first men. And they are a very interesting type. They have a whole bunch of different subgenders, no longer just male and female. Uh, they, they're connected together telepathically. They're essentially immortal, although, you know, they can kill themselves or be destroyed, you know, in accidents and stuff like that. And they live an incredibly long time until the sun is about to go supernova. And then they have to decide what they're going to do. And they send out, they're described by Stapleton as viruses to seed life throughout the galaxy. 
And, you know, they have already escaped the bounds of time and space. And we get to the very end of the novel where this is the last paragraph. One thing is certain. Man himself, at the very least, is music, a brave theme that makes music also of its vast accompaniment, its matrix of storms and stars. Man himself, in his degree, is essentially a beauty in the eternal form of things. It is very good to have been man. And so we may go forward with laughter in our hearts and peace, thankful for the past and for our own courage. For we shall make, after all, a fair conclusion to this brief music that is man. This is the 18th race, right? In Star Maker, we have even more species and an even wider scope going on. Uh, the, the nameless uh, narrator, he goes to the first world that, you know, he's disembodied that he can uh, find. And he finds that there are beings that are man-like there. And he's willing to call them the other men. He says, I had always supposed man was a unique being, an inconceivably complex conjunction of circumstances had produced him. It was not to be supposed that such conditions would be repeated anywhere in the universe. Yet here on the very first globe to be explored was an obvious peasant. And he goes on and he, he talks you know, about observing him and he says, although evolution on this earth-like planet must have taken a course on the whole surprisingly like that which had produced my own kind, there must have also been many divergences. And he tells us about some of these, you know, the, the importance of the sense of taste for them and the meaning of it for their culture. Eventually he hooks up with a philosopher with whom he starts to explore the cosmos. And they, they go to many different worlds and uh, look at many different uh, races and species. And he says uh, some, some really interesting stuff. This is a little bit later. Most of those worlds were, near, were really no worse than our own. Like us, they'd reached the stage when the spirit, half awakened from brutishness, very far from maturity, can suffer most desperately and behave most cruelly. And like us, these tragic but vital worlds visited in our early adventures were agonized by the inability of their minds to keep pace with changing circumstance. They are always behindhand, always applying old concepts and old ideals inappropriately to novel situations. Like us, they were constantly tortured by their hunger for a degree of community which their condition demanded, but their poor, cowardly, selfish spirits could by no means attain. Only in couples and little circles of companions could they support true community, the communion of mutual insight and respect and, uh, and love. But in their tribes and nations, they conceived all too easily the sham community of the pack, baying in unison of fear and hate. And he says, particularly in one respect, these races were recognizably our kin. Each had risen by a strange mixture of violence and gentleness. The apostles of violence and the apostles of gentleness swayed them this way and that. And at the time of our visit, many of these worlds were in the throes of a crisis of this conflict. And, you know, so he, he tells us this is a, a pattern that gets replicated over and over again. And he says, the most numerous of all classes of intelligent worlds is that which includes the planet familiar to readers of this book. Homo sapiens has recently flattered and frightened himself by conceiving that, though perhaps he is not the sole intelligence in the cosmos, he is at least unique, and the world suited to intelligent life of any kind must be extremely rare. This view proves ludicrously false. In comparison with the unimaginable number of the stars, intelligent worlds are indeed very rare. But we discovered some thousands of worlds, much like the Earth, and possessed by beings of essentially humankind, though superficially they were often unlike the type that we call human. The other men were amongst the most obviously human, but in a later stage of our adventure, when our research was no longer restricted to worlds that had reached the familiar spiritual crisis, we stumbled on a few planets inhabited by races almost identical with Homo sapiens, or rather with the creature that Homo sapiens was in the earliest phase of his existence. And then he goes on and talks about the many, many other strange mankinds, to use a chapter title. And he says that, you know, these all developed, these humans developed from non 
human in our you know sense uh creatures and you know there are echinoderms uh, we're going to see that there's an incredibly important role played by these ichthyoids and arachnoids that wind up in a symbiotic relation uh, with each other. Um, and, you know, he goes on des describing nautiloids. You know, it's almost like a travel journal by this point. Um, and then, you know, we've got the uh, uh, symbiotic race described. Um, we have the plant men, uh, composite beings. Uh, who are sort of like birds and, and all of that. And he goes, goes on and on and on. And what's important about this, all of them are human beings in some important sense. And eventually there's going to be a galactic community of worlds, the building of which lies beyond the, the comprehension of the writer of this book, he says. And he says that there's, this is kind of an interesting idea, three kinds of activity occupied the minded worlds in this phase of galactic history. The main practical work was to enrich and harmonize the life of the galaxy itself, to increase the number and diversity and mental unity of the fully awakened worlds up to the point which it was believed was demanded for the emergence of a mode of experience more awakened than any hitherto attained. So, you know, creating more and more diversity among humans. What's the second? He says, the second kind of activity was that which sought to make closer contact with other galaxies by physical and telepathic study. The third was the spiritual exercise appropriate to beings of the rank of world minds. This last seems to have been concerned at once with the deepening of the self-awareness of each individual world spirit and the detachment of its will from merely private fulfillment. So we've got each race is now contributing to an even greater project, you could say. The last thing that I want to bring up here as well you could say, well, there is at least one exception or several exceptions to human, right? And I think that Stapleton is, is fine with that. There are these stars which are found to be sentient and to have their own kind of communication going on. And the human races within this galactic, uh, you know, union are able to communicate with them eventually. And the stars themselves have to decide what to do with these seeming parasites that are messing around with the galaxy. They even find what's called a stunted cosmical spirit in the great megatheria, the nebulae. And uh, all of these are forms of life. All of these are forms of sentience. They're not all necessarily men or human beings, but they are getting connected with each other through communication, through a common life together into a cosmos. And this brings us to, you know, we can't cover every single philosophical theme we would like to necessarily, but this brings us to one of the grandest philosophical themes that Stapledon himself is going to think a lot about over the course of his life and encounter other people who are, you know, talking about this and weave it into the very history of the cosmos itself, the quest, you could say, for absolute spirit. Another one of the great philosophical themes is in the title, Star Maker, a, a being that is capable not only of creating a star or a bunch of stars or the Big Bang or the cosmos, but as we find out, a hypercosmos, something that is an intelligent, uh, beyond intelligence perhaps, entity that is bound up with the entire universe and universes on universes can be understood, can be sought by intelligent races, and yet in some way transcends them. And, you know, there's sort of intimations of this in the, you know, last and first men, for example, um, you know, the, the last men who also, you know, are kind of similar to the fifth men in many respect. 
Um, you know, they've got a kind of melancholy thinking about the nature of the universe, that things are eventually going to, to wind down, but that they can access all these previous minds throughout space and time. The discovery says that past events were persistent and accessible was for the fifth men a source of great deep joy, but it also caused them a new distress, right? And we have even more of that with the 18th last men who are realizing that uh, there's, you know, this folly in a doomed world, a community that was yesterday the very flower of a galaxy, you know, why are we persisting in our efforts? You know, there's, there's that uh, sort of thing going on. And they're you know, thinking, well, what, what caused all this? What's, what's the point to all of this, right? Great are the stars and man is of no account to them. Man is a fair spirit whom a star conceived and a star kills. He's greater than those blind, bright companies. For though in them there is incalculable, incalculable potentiality, in him there is achievement, small but actual, right? And he says, man was winged, hopefully he had in him to go further than this short flight now ending. He proposed even that he should become the flower of all things, that he should learn to be the all-knowing, the all-admiring. Instead, he's to be destroyed. So, you know, human beings and the races of human beings, intelligence had the potential to become something so much greater, you know, masters of the universe. Well, in a way that's not needed because there is indeed a master of the universe who in Star Maker is being called the Star Maker, right? And he, he's, he goes on, and um, this is, you know, the, the narrator after they've gathered a bunch of mentalities to them. And he says, <clears throat> it must not be supposed the normal fate of intelligent races in the galaxy is to triumph. Um, you know, many humans, uh, many other worlds of human rank uh, were rich in history, but, you know, they had a downfall, Right. And he says, I've already said that as our experience of the destruction of worlds increased, we were increasingly dismayed by the wastefulness and seeming aimlessness of the universe. So many worlds, after so much distress, attained so nearly to social peace and joy, only to have the cup snatched from them forever. And he goes on and on here, and he says, um, the sustaining motive of our, of our pilgrimage going through space and time had been the hunger which formerly drove men on earth in search of God. Yes, we had one and all left our native planets in order to discover whether, regarding the cosmos as a whole, the spirit which we had all in our hearts obscurely knew and haltingly prized, the spirit which on earth we sometimes call humane, was Lord of the universe or outlaw, almighty or crucified. And now it was becoming clear to us that if the cosmos had any Lord, he was not that spirit, but some other whose purpose in creating the endless fountain of worlds was not fatherly towards the beings he had made, but alien, inhuman, dark. And so, you know, he talks about seeing religion in all of these different worlds being worked out. And this, you know, this is a pessimistic point in it, but later on, we're going to find that, you know, as this entire society spanning the galaxy and going out to other galaxies, what he calls the galactic utopia is uh, developing that um, they begin, well, they continue and they deepen their search for this great being who started it all. Here is in, ch in chapter uh, 10, a vision of the galaxy. It seemed to us now the troubles of the many worlds of this galaxy were at last over, that the will to support the galactic utopia was now universal, and that the future must bring glory after glory. We felt assured of the same progress in other galaxies. In our simplicity, we look forward to the speedy, the complete, and final triumph of the striving spirit throughout the cosmos. We even conceived that the star maker rejoiced in the perfection of his work. Using such symbols as we could to express the inexpressible, we imagined that before the beginning, the star maker was alone. And for love and for community, he resolved to make a perfect creature to be his mate. 
We imagined that he made her of his hunger for beauty and his will for love, but that he also scourged her in the making and tormented her so that she might at last triumph over all adversity and thereby achieve such perfection as he and his almightiness could never attain the cosmos we conceived to be that creature. And it seemed to us that we'd already witnessed the greater part of cosmical growth. And uh, there only remained the climax of that growth, the telepathic union of all the galaxies in order to become the single, fully awakened spirit of the cosmos, perfect, fit to be eternally contemplated and enjoyed by the star maker. So what do we have going on here? Let's take a pause for just a moment in the narrative. You know, we have this incredibly complex galactic civilization that has developed that is able to like see into the past and to, you know, recuperate what is good from it. Uh, incredible sensitivity of emotion, uh, a utopian world in which the things that are separating us and not just separating us human beings of the present, but also the, the human beings throughout the cosmos have been overcome a very, you know, blissful state, you could say, but a very active state. Well, Stapleton himself admitted to being influenced by Benedict Spinoza, the <coughs> great, you know, um, uh, rationalist philosopher, uh, pantheist uh, in a certain respect, who, you know, wrote the ethics and a bunch of other interesting uh, treatises as well, and who argued that there was only one substance, and that is God or nature, and we are all merely modes of it. And this is, you know, a philosopher that has captivated many people's minds for uh, centuries, still does today. But, uh, you know, I have to say on the whole, Spinoza's viewpoint on this is much less dynamic than another great thinker coming, you know, a, a little bit later on, well, actually over a century and a half later on, Hegel, uh, Georg Friedrich Wilhelm Hegel, who conceives of all of human history as being the development of Geist, consciousness, mind, spirit, you know, and, uh, you know, thought that, that we had been developing essentially into whatever God was supposed to be here on earth through our history, through um, all the you know, previous struggles and trials that had produced some advances dialectically. I would say Stapleton actually goes beyond both of those thinkers in how he's conceiving of this. And it's interesting, you know, Hegel, uh, Hegel, so Spinoza has God or nature and he doesn't really talk about, you know, other worlds or anything like that. Hegel, it's this world and human history has been developing and it's a very Eurocentric perspective that he has as well. You know, it's, it's been developing in the West and basically we're all done. Now we just need to make things more rational. Stapleton thinks that this is only going to happen. I mean, worlds can have world spirits. He actually uses that name in Star Maker. Um, but we need to have more than a world spirit. We need to have spirits of much larger communities that include all sorts of rational beings, even the stars themselves, as we're going to find. And the end of the book, uh, once we get past the, the incorporation of the stars, is a very long discussion about the star maker, right? And, um, you know, how the star maker works. And he, and he tells us that, um, you know, the, 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 as the human author of the book, I have a difficult time describing this, but he goes into, you know, page after page, actually, quite a, quite a few, uh, talking about the supreme moment of the cosmos. I, as the cosmical mind, seem to be confronted with the source and goal of all finite things. I did not, of course, in that moment, sensuously perceive the infinite spirit, the star maker, but what I did perceive was its presence. And he says, it seemed to me that I now saw the star maker in two aspects, as the spirit's particular creative mode that had given rise to me, the cosmos, and also more dreadfully as something incomparably greater than creativity, 
namely as the eternally achieved perfection of the, notice the use of the term here, absolute spirit, which is the term that Hegel uses in his works, right? And there were a lot of British Hegelians that Stapledon was in contact with. As a matter of fact, he criticizes them in his uh, uh, Theory of Ethics book that he writes early on. Um, so he's incorporating this, though, into the Star Maker. And I'm not going to ruin for you all the uh, discussions that he goes into, you know, about, about creation and the many different creations that are taking place. But I will tell you that there's, you know, this division into immature creating, uh, you know, the very first attempts. And then there's uh, later on, after a whole bunch of interesting things, mature creating, right? And... <clears throat> He goes, he sort of ranges over a number of different creation ideas or, or myths. Remember, too, you know, Stapledon is trying to create myths in here. And um, the star maker in the mature creating creates all sorts of things that go beyond just creating a cosmos, right? He creates... Um, creations that can be intelligent. Uh, he creates, as he says, many strange forms of time um, and, you know, all different ways in which beings can be connected with each other, can be related to each other, can be conscious of each other and of the universe. And it, it ends by talking about, is this is a chapter, the ultimate cosmos and the eternal spirit. So he says, In vain my fatigued, my tortured attention, strained to follow the increasingly subtle creations, which according to my dream the star maker conceived, cosmos after cosmos issued from his fervent imagination, each one with a distinctive spirit, infinitely diversified, each in its fullest attainment, more awakened than the last, but each one less comprehensible to me. At length, so my dream, my myth declared, the star maker, star maker created his ultimate and most subtle cosmos for which all others were but tentative preparations. Of this final creature, I can say only that it embraced with its own organic texture the essences of all predecessors. And far more besides, it was like the last movement of a symphony which may embrace by the significance of its themes, the essence of the earlier movements and far more besides. And he calls this a metaphor that extravagantly understates the subtlety and complexity of the ultimate cosmos. I would say that this is actually what what Hegel was groping towards in his talk of the dialectic and sublation or Aufhebung and this progression of mind developing itself through all of history. So Stapledon is, in a certain respect, through, through the, the use of narrative and imaginatively projecting aeons into the future, but, but peopling it with not just, you know, many, many million years hence, peopling it with a uh, narrative is accomplishing what it was that thinkers like Hegel and his, you know, British uh, idealist successors were trying to figure out. And Stapledon is, is providing these to us as what he's calling myths, as something that we could be working towards and um you know this is he's not saying dogmatically that there is a star maker or anything like that but he is kind of saying that if there is going to be a star maker and it's going to be as great as we could possibly conceive this is what it would have to look like so this is a fitting place i think to end these discussions of these two great novels by olaf stapleton the last and first men and Star Maker.